In addition to the plasma, blood also contains a fraction called the formed elements, which include erythrocytes, or red blood cells, leukocytes, or white blood cells, and thrombocytes, also known as platelets. And if you think about it, I think thrombocytes would make a great band name, wouldn't it? Anyway, we can start our discussion of formed elements with the erythrocytes, or the red blood cells. Erythros is from the Greek word for red. We have about 20 trillion red blood cells in our body at any given moment. That's 2 times 10 to the 13th. But they only live for about 120 days, about 4 months. Their main job is transporting gases, especially oxygen, but also carbon dioxide, in the blood. Red blood cells are made in the bone marrow in a process called erythropoiesis. That comes from the Greek word meaning making or creation. In adults, this process only happens in certain bones, specifically the femur, the vertebrae, pelvis, ribs, and sternum. In infants, it happens in more bones through the body, but as you age and the bones uh, ossify more, most of the bones lose that special red bone marrow to make these red blood cells. The rate at which they're produced is regulated by a hormone called erythropoietin. Notice the word there, erythro red poietin, proesis creation, so red creator, or EPO, which is made in the kidneys. EPO production depends on the amount of oxygen in the air. That's actually why some athletes choose to train at higher altitudes. The lower oxygen content of high altitude air causes their kidneys to make more EPO, which causes their bone marrow to make more red blood cells, which increases the amount of oxygen their blood can carry. That effect will last a little while after you come down from the high altitude until those extra red blood cells die off. This is also the idea behind blood doping, where people take synthetic erythropoietin to jumpstart that process. When red blood cells are first made, they come out as the form of a reticulocyte. Reticulocytes have no mitochondria in them, and then about a day after they're made, they expel their nuclei. They just kind of spit it out into the blood and it decays. So a mature red blood cell doesn't have any nucleus, has no DNA, and it has no mitochondria, which means they can't reproduce, they can't make any new protein, and they can't do aerobic metabolism, which is a good thing. We actually don't want red blood cells doing aerobic metabolism, given that they are so very numerous. If they were using oxygen for their metabolism, they would consume it all, and they wouldn't be able to deliver any to the rest of our cells. So having those red blood cells only able to do anaerobic metabolism is actually to our advantage. These red blood cells are shaped as biconcave discs, uh, which is a word that basically means they look like a donut which didn't quite get the hole punched all the way through. They're about usually six to eight microns across, that's micrometers, which is small for a cell, for a body cell, and about two microns thick. Now, if they don't have a nucleus or mitochondria, we might wonder, what do they have inside? Well, the answer to that is that they contain about 250 million hemoglobin proteins each. So hemoglobin is a protein made of four smaller polypeptides that are bound together. Uh, most adult hemoglobin has two what we call alpha subunits and two beta subunits. Each of those subunits has a heme group bound to it. So a heme group isn't something that really fits into any of the major biomolecule groups we talked about. It's a complex organic molecule built around a central atom of iron. This is actually an ion, charged iron atom. That iron atom can reversibly bind to a single molecule of oxygen. This is how hemoglobin carries oxygen. So one hemoglobin protein has four subunits, each of which has a heme group, each of which can carry one oxygen. So one complete hemoglobin protein can carry four oxygen molecules, or fewer at times. When red blood cells die, they are handled mostly by the spleen and, to a lesser degree, the liver. So when they die, the cellular components, things like the plasma membrane, are simply broken down and recycled. The hemoglobin proteins is removed. And then hemoglobin is also broken down. So hemoglobin is separated into the protein part, 
which is broken down into amino acids and recycled throughout the body. So those amino acids are sent in the blood off to any other cells that could use them. The other part that comes out of that <clears throat> is the heme groups. The heme groups are separated into the iron, which mostly is taken back to the liver and bone marrow. Transported using the protein transferrin. which we mentioned earlier, to be used to make new hemoglobin and other things that use iron in the body. The other part of the heme group, the rest of the heme group, other than the iron atom itself, becomes bilirubin. That bilirubin is going to be used for a few other things. So just to remind us, Red blood cells are broken down. Part of what comes out of is the hemoglobin, which then has the heme group removed, and the heme is converted into bilirubin. Bilirubin goes to the liver, which converts it into the substance bile. Bile is secreted from the liver and goes down into the intestines. We'll talk about that when we get to the digestive system. Uh, when it's not actively being put into the intestines, it builds up in the gallbladder, which can then squeeze extra bile into the intestine when it's needed. So bile is added to the intestine. It's used to help emulsify fat as part of digestion. Some of it is just lost during defecation, but some of it is actually broken down by bacteria. The bacteria convert some of that bilirubin, some of that bile, back into bilirubin. And then convert that into a couple of different things. The bilirubin can be converted into urobilinogen, which is reabsorbed into the body. and ends up excreted in the urine as both urobilin and some urobilinogen. That's what gives urine its yellowish color. The other thing that bilirubin is converted to by those bacteria is stercobilin which is excreted in the feces and is what gives feces their brownish color. Now, it's also worth noting here, we should take a moment to talk about the fact that there's a condition that can come when we have a buildup of bilirubin in the body. And that condition is jaundice. We produce bilirubin at a steady rate from the breakdown of red blood cells. Normally, the bilirubin is converted into bile and then ends up excreted or turned into other things in the body. But if the liver isn't, e isn't able to keep up with the amount of bilirubin being produced by the body, that bilirubin can build up in the body and it turns the skin and the sclera of the eyes yellow. Depending on the extent, that may or may not be a problem. A lot of bilirubin is toxic if you end up with too much of it. So you can end up with jaundice coming from damage to the liver. So if you have some sort of damage to the liver, say hepatitis or alcoholic cirrhosis, the liver may be unable to handle the amount of bilirubin you're getting. 
You can also get jaundice from getting too much bilirubin. So if you have, for example, some sort of hemolytic anemia, where you're breaking down an unusual number of red blood cells, you can end up producing enough bilirubin that the liver has trouble keeping up with it. You can also end up with jaundice from gallstones. So gallstones make it so we can't put bile into the intestine. They can block the bile duct. Those gallstones can cause us to build up bile, and then the liver ends up unable to produce any more bile, so we end up with a buildup of bilirubin. So either too much of this, something like hemolytic anemia, not enough of this, something like gallstones, or damage to the liver, where it can't convert the bilirubin, things like hepatitis or cirrhosis, can end up putting us in a condition where we end up with too much bilirubin and thus jaundice. Now another group can, another group of individuals often get jaundice, and that's newborns. Newborn jaundice is very common, and there's a couple of reasons for that. Number one, newborn livers are relatively immature, so they have a little trouble keeping up with the normal breakdown of red blood cells. Plus, fetuses are born, when, when fetuses are in utero, they have a version of hemoglobin that's a little bit different from adult hemoglobin. Fetal hemoglobin actually binds oxygen better than adult hemoglobin which is necessary. If you've got a fetus getting, its, getting oxygen from the mother, the fetal blood needs to be able to pull oxygen from the mother's blood. So having hemoglobin that's better at binding oxygen will let it pull oxygen from the mother. But when you're born, you have to start switching over to adult hemoglobin. And so right around birth and ver the early days of life, fetuses are going through this process where they're breaking down a lot of their fetal hemoglobin and turning it into adult hemoglobin, and making adult hemoglobin. In that process, you're breaking down extra hemoglobin, so you end up with more bilirubin than usual. So it's fairly common for newborns to end up with some level of jaundice. Uh, I don't know very much about perinatal care, but my understanding is that mild jaundice, which is common, doesn't usually need to be treated. I know that when my children were born, the doctor said, take them out and hold them up in the sun naked because sunlight in the skin helps to break down bilirubin. More severe jaundice, uh, babies can be put under bilirubin lights in their bassinets or whatever the term is for those things where you put the babies. Uh, those bilirubin lights do the same thing that sunlight does, helps to break down the bilirubin. You can even get vests or blankets with built-in bilirubin lights so that you can wrap your baby up in them like a glowing burrito from Tron and have that light on their skin 24 hours a day to help with breaking down the, the bilirubin. Leukocytes are white blood cells. Leuco is Greek for white, cytes from the base word for cells. Our bodies contain five types of leukocytes overall. Basophils are the first type. These secrete histamines in response to invasion or allergens. Those histamines trigger, trigger inflammation and immune responses. So in a way, these are the ones that sort of yell when something shows up. Eosinophils have a weak ability to phagocytize. So we'll note that weakly phagocytic. Phagocytosis meaning cell eating, is the process by which a cell comes up on an invader and engulfs it. And that invader will then be digested. Eosinophils have a weak ability to phagocytize, but mostly what they do is combat invasion by parasites. They're specialized for that. Neutrophils are also phagocytic, although their capacities are somewhat limited. What's special about neutrophils is that they are one of the first cells to respond to any damage to the skin or invasion of microorganisms, and they tend to show up in enormous numbers. They don't live very long, only a few hours usually. 
but they come in gigantic numbers. So as soon as there's an invasion of the body, you get a flood of neutrophils to the area, and they're the first line ones that start attacking the bacteria, trying to phagocytize them. Uh, the pus that you find around a wound, that sort of clear, slightly yellowish fluid, is largely dead neutrophils. Monocytes circulate in the blood and are also phagocytic. What's kind of interesting about these is that they become macrophages. They can leave the blood vessel and enter tissue. These also respond to the site of injury. They also sort of patrol tissue looking for stuff. Macrophages, meaning big eaters, are large sort of blob amoeba-like cells that creep around and chase down and engulf invading things and destroy them. They are also involved in cleaning up dead cells and debris of our own body. Another interesting thing about macrophages is that they present antigens to the immune system. So let's say, for example, our macrophage is going to be attacking this little microorganism. So here comes our macrophage. It engulfs that. and digest it. So within here, we're going to now break up this little piece of whatever it was. The macrophage will then present on its surface little pieces of the thing that it digested so that other immune cells can investigate that and learn about what it is that the macrophage found. It's sort of like a morbid molecular show and tell where the macrophage says, hey, look what I ate today. Finally, lymphocytes are part of what we call our adaptive immune system, where it's the part of our immune system that learns about and responds to invaders. So lymphocytes do a number of things. They identify and remember invaders. They produce antibodies, which are globulin proteins that circulate in the blood, bind to specific tags on, called antigens on the surface of invaders, and trigger immune responses to the, when they tag something. In addition, these destroy our own body cells when they've been invaded or otherwise become abnormal. And they're involved in coordinating immune responses. So that's leukocytes in a nutshell. You'll learn a lot more about those in microbiology if you haven't already taken it. The last of the formed elements we're going to look at are thrombocytes, also known as platelets. Thrombo comes from the Greek word for clot. So thrombocytes are little cell fragments. They're tiny, about two to three microns across, and they contain no nucleus and really no organelles. Really, they're just a little bag of cell membrane with some surface receptor proteins, a little bit of machinery on the inside, and granules of chemicals that they can release when they are activated. They come from cells called megakaryocytes, which live outside of blood vessels, like so. So this is a megakaryocyte. Those megakaryocytes squeeze a little bit into the blood vessel and then shed little pieces. Those pieces become platelets. There's about uh, one platelet for every 10 to 20 red blood cells. So if you figure there's 20 trillion red blood cells, that means there's uh, one or two trillion platelets in the body at any given time. They don't live very long because they have no nucleus and really no organelles of any sort. They only live about nine days. 
Platelets don't usually do very much, but their main purpose is in coagulation or blood clotting. So platelets normally spend most of their time doing nothing, sort of just drifting around. But when there is damage to a vessel, we trigger a process by which platelets are involved in creating a blood clot which will stop any leak from that vessel and prevent other things from getting in as quickly as possible. It's kind of a neat function of blood. So let's take a moment to take a look at how coagulation works. We'll start our discussion of the coagulation process by looking at a blood vessel. So in this blood vessel, notice the blood vessel is lined with, in shown in red here, a thin layer of cells called endothelium. Those are the cells that form the lining. Those cells are stuck to a layer of proteins, mostly collagen, also including elastin. So we'll say collagen and elastin, which form this layer called the basal lamina. Think of it as sort of a meshwork that the endothelial cells are stuck to. That basal lamina is created and maintained by these cells called fibroblasts. Those are the ones that lay down that protein, those protein fibers. Inside the blood vessel, we have red blood cells. In blue, I'm showing platelets. And in light blue, little tiny dots, those are going to represent a variety of plasma proteins. Uh, there's a lot of different proteins in here. So we could, we could list among them clotting factors, there's a goodly number of those, and we're not going to get into the details on that, as well as fibrinogen and plasminogen. Those are some proteins that are going to be important as we talk about this process of coagulation. So next we're going to show what happens when there's a problem. When everything is okay, these platelets are staying dormant. Uh, they don't really do much most of the time, and part of that is because this endothelium secretes chemicals which act to keep the platelets dormant. Think of it almost like a platelet lullaby. So our, endothelia, our endothelial cells are secreting stuff which soothes the platelets and prevents them from activating. Now let's see what happens when there's a problem. To look at the coagulation process, let's take a look at a similar vessel to the one we just saw, but this one will have a break. You can see here how the endothelial cells have been damaged and there's exposed collagen and some fibroblasts exposed, exposed to the bloodstream. Now several things are going to happen here and while we may have to talk about them one after the other, really they're all happening at the same time. I'll do my best to represent that, but it's a little tricky to draw that. The first one I'm going to mention is that platelets, when they run into collagen, they have receptors for collagen. When they run in, they become sticky. They'll attach themselves to that collagen. So my platelets start glomming on to that collagen. And when that happens, they undergo some changes. They become what we call activated platelets. It's actually funny. They go from being sort of disc-shaped to suddenly throwing out little barbs, and other platelets start to stick to them. In addition, when platelets are activated, they start releasing some of those chemicals from granules within them, which contributes to a series of reactions with the clotting factors called the coagulation cascade. I'll sketch that in here in a moment. That gets very complicated and we are not going to get into the details on that cascade. One last thing is that the fibrinogen, which is in the bloodstream, that one of those plasma proteins, starts sticking to those activated platelets. So I'm going to draw in some of that, but I don't want to draw in too much yet. So I'll come back to adding, adding more platelets there. At the same time that that's happening, there are two other things happening. These clotting factors, proteins in the blood, interact with the collagen directly. So collagen has an interaction with these clotting factors. Sometimes we call that the intrinsic pathway. The, same, the clotting factors also interact with a protein found on the surface of fibroblasts, a protein called tissue factor. So clotting factors interacting with tissue factor 
something we call the extrinsic pathway. So all of these are happening at the same time. The platelets sticking to the collagen becoming activated and releasing chemicals which affect the, the clotting factors. At the same time, the intrinsic pathway where the clotting factors are reacting to the, the exposed collagen and the clotting factors reacting to the tissue factor on the fibroblast, which is the extrinsic pathway. Now our platelets, our activated platelets are now glomming together into a large mass that's actually going to start blocking blood flow. We call that mass a platelet plug and it slows blood flow through this vessel, also limits the amount of blood that can leak out of the damaged area. Now, all of these interactions, the activated platelets, the extrinsic and intrinsic factors, all go into a very complicated series of reactions, the coagulation cascade. And for our purposes, the most important end result of that is that it produces an enzyme called thrombin. So all of these together go into a Shazam mechanism which produces thrombin. Thrombin, the enzyme, does two things. One, it acts on fibrinogen turning fibrinogen into fibrin. So our fibrinogen becomes fibrin. Fibrin polymerizes. Little fibrin units add together to form long, long tough strands of fibrin, which start reinforcing our platelet plug. So this is now fibrin. The fibrin reinforces the plug, also catches red blood cells, and a protein called plasminogen. And as my platelets, fibrin, and red blood cells all conglomerate here, I end up with a full-fledged blood clot. That's going to block blood flow through the vessel and limit and block leakage of blood through here. That clot also, ha also helps protect us from things which might be invading through any damage here. Thrombin also feeds back into this cascade. It goes back and encourages more platelet activation. And goes back and affects this cascade directly. So a feedback mechanism. So this clot blocks off the blood flow through this vessel and we have a chance to repair the damage that's been done. Now. Once the damage is repaired, we get kind of a neat trick here. Through a signal that is not yet absolutely clear, my plasminogen that I gathered in that fibrin net gets turned into an enzyme called plasmin. Plasmin dissolves the fibrin. So once the plasmin is produced, it attacks the fibrin, the fibrin breaks up, and the clot breaks up and drifts away in, in little pieces. That dissolves the blood clot and allows blood to flow through the vessel again. So not only can we automatically block any leakages in our own blood vessels, but once the leakage is repaired, the block dissolves and disappears. It's a really fantastic mechanism. There are some clinical applications of this too. Blood clots forming when you don't want them in vessels is a major source of things like heart attacks and strokes. When a, if you form a blockage in a vessel, you can then deny blood flow to anything downstream. And if that's heart or brain tissue, those tissues are very dependent on that blood flow and they can die. 
One possible treatment for strokes, if you can get to them quickly, is applying things which activate the plasminogen in the clot, things like uh, tissue plasminogen activator and other materials, that if you inject those into a person who's having a stroke, if you can do it quickly, you may be able to dissolve the blood clot that's causing the stroke and thus re restore blood flow to the area that needs it. And that's the end of our story about blood for now. Next lecture, we will cover the heart, how it's put together, uh, how cardiac muscle works, how action potentials work differently in cardiac muscle than they do elsewhere, excitation contraction coupling, and start getting into how the heart's contraction is organized and coordinated. See you then.